Hello, it's Scott Manley here. 30 years ago, I was still a student at the University of Glasgow, and every now and then we'd have people come and talk about their research. One thing that got talked about quite a lot at the University of Glasgow Physics Department was gravitational waves. Back then, we didn't know whether gravitational waves existed. They were just a consequence of general relativity. And we knew that measuring them was going to be exceptionally difficult. But a bunch of scientists and engineers in, at Glasgow and other institutions around the world were developing the technology to look for them, specifically interferometers which used arms several kilometers long that could detect the subtle squeezing and stretching of space-time by the interference of lasers which were sent along each path of the interferometer. As they came back, they would be recombined, and if there was any change in the path length, that would adjust the phase of the light coming from each path, and when they were combined, they would interfere with each other and provide a massively sensitive uh, instrument for detecting changes in the, the length of each path. And as many of you probably know, back in 2015, gravitational waves went from being something theoretical on paper to something that had actually been observed using the Laser Interferometry Gravitational Observatory, or LIGO. And while this was Nobel Prize winning work, it was merely the first step to building bigger and better gravitational wave observatories. Even back in the 1990s, I remember the discussion about a massively ambitious gravitational wave telescope, which would be millions of kilometers across because instead of being on the Earth, it would be free flying in space, three spacecraft working together. This concept was called LISA, the Laser Interferometer Space Antenna. And while we knew it would be possible according to the laws of physics, there were many technical challenges that would have to be solved to make this possible. And now we're reaching the point where this is going to happen. Now, one of the basic principles about a gravitational wave antenna, and indeed general antenna, is that the frequencies that you can observe get lower as you make the antenna longer. So LIGO has like four kilometer arms. Its lowest frequency it can observe is about 100 hertz. That means that your gravitational source needs to be oscillating at those speeds. And this is only really happening when you have stellar mass black holes spiraling around each other hundreds or thousands of times a second in the last few moments before they merge. And that's great because you can make audible chirps from the gravitational wave signals. And that is great. It's a wonderful illustration of science and a proof of Einstein's you know, theory of general relativity. However, there's a problem because as the black holes get bigger, their event horizons get longer and it takes light longer to go around. That is the shortest orbit uh, you know, is based upon the size of the black hole. So for black holes that are at the center of the galaxy that are millions or even billions of solar masses, the final orbits take minutes or even hours and are far too low frequency to be detected by these terrestrial gravitational wave telescopes. And now you may remember there was another way that gravitational wave were observed using pulsar timing because pulsars are many, many light years away. The arm length is very long. And so it's possible by observing the subtle changes in the timing of pulsar clicks, uh, you can see changes in the length between you know, the observer and the star. And recently, the Nanograv Consortium published data showing that there was a nanohertz level signal. That's a signal with a frequency that is measured in, you know, decades. So here's a handy little chart showing the frequency and sensitivity range of these three mechanisms. On the right, you have LIGO, soon to become advanced LIGO. On the left, you have the pulsar timing. And right in the middle, you have this band that can only be seen by something with arms a million kilometers or more. That is where LISA is going to operate. And that is why so much priority was placed on this, because it's the only way to probe this section of the gravitational wave spectrum. And so the scientific case for building something like LISA is very, very strong. However, there were great technical headwinds. There were te technological challenges that absolutely had to be solved before you could build this. 
So again, the, the way that gravitational wave telescopes work is that you're measuring the distances along arms uh, that are at an angle to each other. Now on the Earth, this is typically set up with two beam paths at 90 degrees to each other. But in space, everything has to follow an orbit. So they use this arrangement with three satellites generating an equilateral triangle. And this is actually really exaggerated compared to what the real thing is. This is a version that I implemented in Universe Sandbox, and you can see that the scale is much more compact. So we have three satellites orbiting at one AU semi-major axis, the same period as the Earth, but lagging behind it by about 20 degrees. And they're all in these orbits which have an inclination of 0.953 uh, degrees, and the eccentricity is like 0 0.096. So it's less than one degree inclination, 1% eccentricity. And the positions are staggered in such a way that as they orbit around the sun, they orbit in this equilateral triangle. And to be clear, they're not orbiting each other. There's no gravitational interactions between them. They're orbiting the sun, and the specific orbits chosen keep them at roughly the same distance to each other throughout the entire orbit. Now, since detecting gravitational waves requires accurately measuring the changes in lengths between these arms, you might think that the gravitational effects of all the other planets are just going to absolutely swamp this signal. But it turns out that, assuming you know where all the planets are, you can subtract out those signals. And also, since these uh, forces, these tidal forces, tend to change on the order of months, you can actually eliminate those signals just by filtering based on very low frequencies. Focusing on signals with periods of minutes. What is much more important is eliminating the non-gravitational effects. The spacecraft are going to be experiencing radiation pressure from the sun. There might be drag from magnetic fields or you know part particles in space, solar wind. All these things would swamp the gravitational wave signal. So instead, the spacecraft actually contain a cavity inside them, which will have a gravitational test mass. This is going to be a drag-free satellite design. The idea is this test mass will float free, and as there's forces on the external spacecraft that move it around, the spacecraft will push back to maintain the test mass floating freely in the correct position, so it can be analysed by the laser system. For science mode, the spacecraft will have to maintain position to within 100 micrometers and rotation to within 10 milliradians. And so knowing that this would absolutely challenge the technology of the day, the European Space Agency took the decision to send up a test mission first, the LISA Pathfinder. This spacecraft it modelled many of the systems and it included a version of the test mass system, which would have two masses operating on the same spacecraft, but uh, only 38 centimetres apart, rather than 2.5 million kilometres. And this promo video, by the way, this dude, Paul McNamara, he was in my astronomy class. Which, of course, instantly means that I have to do this video way better because he will be so judgmental if I get this wrong. So the LISA Pathfinder mission launched in December of 2015 on a Vega rocket. It moved to the L1 point between the Earth and the Sun. And then for about a year and a half, it demonstrated all the components of the, the LISA mission. So we had the two free-floating test masses and the laser system, which the masses were held to within one hundredth of a nanometer precision. The laser frequency was demonstrated to operate correctly and all the components w were shown to work for the duration of the mission. But with a path length of only 40 centimetres, there weren't any gravitational waves that could be detected. But it did show that the technology was fundamentally sound and that Europe would be able to proceed to building three satellites using the same technology and have a reasonable chance of detecting gravitational waves. So the test masses are these small cubes made of gold and platinum. And the test uh, you know, volume it is obviously it's a Faraday cage to protect from the outside, but it also has uh, electrodes which can be used for capacitive sensing for the location. And these electrodes can also be used to push the uh, object around. There's a little window that can be used for the laser uh, for, for the laser light. There's uh, an electrostatic discharge system that uses an ultraviolet laser. And you can see at the corner, there's these little notches that are cut out. That is for the caging mechanism that holds it during the launch process. And there's these square indentations at the top, which are used for the square hold and release mechanism.
So during launch, the masses are held in place by these eight anchor points uh, at the corners. Once it's in space and ready to deploy, those will pull back permanently and they will never re-engage. At that point, the mass is held by these two plungers that insert into these indentations in the middle of the faces. Now, if you've ever seen astronauts manipulating stuff in zero G, you can you know that they can let it go, but typically they don't let it go with zero velocity. It will always have this sort of residual velocity from like natural motions of the muscles and stiction to the skin, things like that. Obviously, this release mechanism on the cubes has to be so much more precise. If the mass is released with a residual velocity of greater than 15 micrometers per second, it will bump into the side of the cavity and they'll have to reset. The maximum acceleration that the positioning electrodes can apply to the test mass is 500 nanometers per second per second. So once the test masses are released and under control, the spacecraft needs to try not influence them in any way. One of the problems you have to deal with is that high energy cosmic rays and solar radiation will come through, penetrate the casing and impact the test mass and they will impart an electrical charge. The electrical charge of the system will change and you need to be able to neutralize it with respect to the spacecraft. So you have this UV laser which can be used to trigger the photoelectric effect on the mass without touching it and allow electrons to flow from the mass to the spacecraft or they can run it in reverse so that they do whatever is necessary to neutralize the charge. Now, a critical part of spacecraft design is mass distribution. You generally want your spacecraft to be balanced precisely. But in the case of LISA, it's even more important because if you have a mass in one place, those test masses will be attracted towards it by gravitation. So you need to actually move masses around the spacecraft to minimize the gravitational potential of the spacecraft itself. And finally, of course, the spacecraft itself needs a very high precision propulsion system so that as these perturbation effects push the spacecraft around, it can fight back and keep the masses in exactly the right location without pushing them. So the spacecraft has an attitude control system that uses high precision micronewton level thrusters. These are cold gas thrusters that will use about 8 kilograms of nitrogen per year. But in the LISA Pathfinder mission, they actually tested uh, an electrical thruster. These were specifically called electrospray thrusters, and they were developed by BUSEC. And I believe that they are a version of what's called a FEEP thruster, a field emission electrostatic uh, propulsion system, which uses uh, essentially like needles to create very strong electric, or electric fields, which will eject ions. And while these operated as expected, uh, it was decided that they would go with the cold gas thrusters for the final mission. Now, there's one other interesting problem that they have to deal with, and that is the fact that they've got two test masses in here. And they will both have slightly different forces on them, and their positions will diverge over time. So the spacecraft has to somehow figure out how to keep both of these in free fall. Well, not quite. You see, they only actually care about this masses being held in free fall along one axis, right? The axis that they're trying to measure. So they can push it to the left and the right of this as long as they don't push it along the direction they're trying to measure. It turns out that if you get two masses sitting at an angle to each other, you can actually come up with a solution where you can move the spacecraft and nudge the masses and keep everything in line without actually affecting the, the sensitive axis, as they call it. I think this is brilliant. So now, yeah, let's talk about the laser measuring system. Now, as I said, we have, this is forming a triangle. You have lasers going in both directions for each legs. And the lasers are shot across two and a half million kilometers of space. There's a 30 centimeter mirror that will collect it and focus it down and direct that light into the optical bench uh, on the spacecraft itself. And this is you know, quite a complicated thing with lasers and beam splitters, prisms. Uh, this is way beyond me, but there's a couple of cool things to mention. Firstly, because of the long distances involved, the laser will actually carry a time code signal, which can be recovered so that they can actually use this to measure the exact distance. The other interesting thing is that since they're firing the lasers across such a long distance, it takes about eight seconds for the light to get across that distance. And they actually need to shoot the laser 
ahead of where the target is to account for the time of flight. So between the time code and the point ahead, the, sat the spacecraft are definitely, you know, cooperating with each other. Also, because these spacecraft are free flying, the distances between them will actually change over time just due to orbital mechanics, orbital precession. They'll, the maximum speed, I think, relative to each other is going to be 12 meters per second. And what they're really going to be measuring isn't so much the change in distance between these arms, it's more going to be the rate of change of the change between these arms. And you can still measure a gravitational wave signal in that manner. Again, ultimately what they're going to do is take a look at the frequency distribution and then filter out anything that's outside the range that they're interested in. Another interesting way the spacecraft are going to cooperate is in communications with Earth. Now, all three spacecraft will have antenna that are capable of pointing at Earth and delivering the kind of signal strength needed. But as they move around the sun, those antennas are going to need repointed. And every time they repoint the antenna, it puts forces on the spacecraft, which means they need to stop doing science. So the strategy they've come up with is they move all three antenna on the spacecraft at the same time, each pointing to slightly different sections. The antenna is good for about five days at a given pointing, and they'll design it so that satellite one works for five, and then the Earth will naturally start to pick up the second one, and then after that's done, it'll naturally pick up the third one. So they'll get 15 days of continuous observing, and then they have to pause and repoint the antenna. So if LISA is developed and launched on schedule, it will launch probably in 2035. It'll launch on an Ariane 6 with four solid rockets. It has to be have a mass of less than 8.2 tons. And then the three spacecraft, having been injected into a transfer orbit, will, under, will move under their own power. They'll have electric propulsion on board, which will take them to their three subtly different orbits and take about a year and a half to get there. Once they get to the target orbit and are set up, then uh, the science mode should be able to operate for at least four and a half years, and quite probably longer depending upon spacecraft reserves. So based on this, I fully expect these things to operate into the 2040s, and perhaps 15 years from now we're going to have some exciting moments when Lisa will predict a massive black hole merger months ahead of time, and we are all ready with all the scientific observation capabilities we have to observe these amazing events. I'm Scott Manley. Fly safe.